All right, so today I'm excited. I want to talk to you about something that the whole world is talking about. If you haven't lived under a rock, you would have heard about this. And really, at its root, it's a discussion about identity. It's trending on TikTok, it's trending on Instagram, it's children, trending in this classroom, it's ch trending on the news, and it even trended in Genesis. Because in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve, the serpent came, as you all know, and he came with a lie. I want to just read that to you, one verse. He says this, Genesis 3, 5, For God does know that in the day that you eat of this fruit, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. See, that lie of the garden has never changed. It is the same lie that is here today. And really what he's saying is, if you buy into what I am selling you, dear Adam and Eve, then you will be like God or as gods. You are, you're going to have this other identity, this really a counterfeit identity because what does it mean to be like God it's well well I can have my way I can do whatever I want to do I can I can whatever it is there's no limitation and it's all about my happiness for them at that moment to make that decision never mind the one true God never mind what he thinks what he has to say but it's gonna be my way and then we think about the conversations today. We have questions like, who am I? What am I? Can I be anything I want? Anyone I want to be? Regardless of who's, who God has made me to be. Another question like, well, what is truth? Can you have your truth? Can I have mine? Or even, what is love? Is love a feeling? Or is love more than a feeling? So today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of these things. However, before we really can answer them, what we need to understand is the most important identity in all of the universe, Jesus. Because if we can understand who He is, the Bible says that He made mankind in His image. Male and female He made them in His image. So we are supposed to be a mirror image, a representation of Him. We are supposed to walk as He walked. We're supposed to imitate Him. So if we can understand who He is, then perhaps through His lens, we can see who He's made us to be. Now, let's read just a little bit about what Jesus says about Himself. Hey, so we see in Revelation 21, 6, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. Okay, so he's saying, I am the beginning. I was there in the beginning. I am the source of all life. And I am the end. I am eternal I am unchanging. I am the one true God. So he is this supreme authority. He is the ultimate proclaimer and determiner of what truth is. If he is who he says he is. And then therefore, he then after that says, I will give you something without payment. And that's a, that's a crazy statement because like if you've lived in this world more than five seconds, you know that nothing is free. You want, you want KFC? You have to pay for it. You want a new toy? You have to pay for it. You want food? You have to pay for it. You want to be, go to a doctor? You have to pay for it. Whatever, even if it's something good that you need, you have to pay for it, whatever that is. But he says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, and I have something rivers of water of life that I will give to the thirsty without payment. Remember that in the garden you were made from dust, right? And to dust you'll return. That means you are like soil. And he is saying you need water. You are dry. And if you come to me, I will give you that water. I will satisfy you. Now, I want to submit to you, he also then says in Revelation 21, 7, to the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, 
and he will be my son. Okay, now that's, that's crazy. So he says that, look, I mean, just, let's just think about this for a second. Like he's saying, look, I am the Alpha the Omega. I am the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, but I'm giving you a heritage. And, and then you're like, well, what do you mean? Why me? Like, didn't we just say that we were made from dust? We are the speck in the universe that he has made. And he looks to you as an individual sitting here and he says, I have a heritage for you. Sonship. To be a son and a daughter of the king. But I mean, that, how does that even make sense? I mean, he, he goes further and he says, I have your hairs numbered. I mean, do you know how many hairs we have average? Average, we have 60 to 150,000 hairs. I know some of us there in the back have less, but <laughs> um, average. So what does that mean? Okay, hair is something that like, you know, it just kind of falls out, new hair grows in. You know, we don't think twice about that. But he says... I have every one of those 150,000 hairs numbered. Now, if that's true, what does it mean about the thoughts we have? How he's numbering our thoughts, how he's, how he's intimately involved in your worries, in your fears, in your desires, in your calling, in everything ahead of you. If he is so concerned with hair that's there today and falls out tomorrow. See, he is intimately involved. And sometimes we have no idea that he's more involved in your life than what you are. He is more involved in your thoughts than what you are. He is more involved in your desires and callings than you are involved in. And so if that's true now, ultimately, how do we prove all of that? He says this, but he doesn't just say it. He proves it. Because we in our depravity, let me ask you a question. Who here has ever took something that's not theirs in their whole life? Whoever, who here has ever looked at a girl or a boy with lust who you're not in covenant marriage with? Okay. Who, is, who has murdered anyone before? No one? Who here's gossiped? Okay, wait, but Jesus said that if you hate your brother in your heart, that is murder in the heart. So you're a bunch of liars. We're all murderers. <laughs> Come on. We have all murdered. We have lied. We have gossiped. We have committed adulteries of the heart. We have done things against God. And you can say, well, Petey, I've helped a lot of ladies across the street. You can say to a judge, if you were dragged before him as a murderer, well, judge, I did a lot of good things. I helped a lot of ladies across the street. I, 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 did, all the, I did more good than I did bad. That's what, that's what you may say to him. And he's going to say, well, I'm glad you helped a lot of ladies across the street, but I'm still going to have to throw you in prison and throw away the key because I'm sending you for that. See, in this world, we have all these religions. And we ask this question, well, what's the difference between what we believe and all the others, there's so many to choose from, right? That's a fair question. But let me tell you the one difference that they don't have. They don't have Jesus. And that's a huge difference. Because in all of the other religions in the world, whether it's Islam, whether it's um, New Age religions, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's any type of philosophy or, or anything, really, even atheism to an extent, is built on the idea, do more good than bad, and then you'll be all right. But ultimately, we know, in, if, or even for logic, that if there is a one true God who is holy and righteous and good, and we stand before Him one day, and we have done any evil, and yet we know that He cannot have evil in His sight, that means that none of us can be there on our own accord. None of us can be in His presence. It's a huge problem for every religion in this world, and none of them have a solution except Jesus who sees our depravity, who sees the fact that we have sinned and we do sin. And he says, come to me, repent of your sin, turn from your sins, turn to me and I will 
lay my life down for you. Jesus goes to the cross and he says, I go at my own accord with my desire to do so for you. I had you in sight. I went with joy. And as he goes, he says, all of your sin, every one of your transgression, every lie, stealing, murderous thing you've done, I put on my shoulders and he, he never did anything wrong. He never sinned once. He was the most undeserving of undeserving. And yet while you deserve death, he went in your place saying, I with joy die in your place so that I can be raised so that you can be raised so that you can stand in right standing with the father. And see, what that means is it's a free gift without payment that is a free gift of salvation for you. Yes, we are called to live holy, righteous, and good. But ultimately, you can't save yourself. When it comes to salvation, no matter how many ladies you help across the street, it's never going to be good enough. You need to give that to Him and grab a hold of His zitzit. And be like, God, Yeshua, I need you to save me. I cannot depend on myself. I cannot save myself. Even from the sin I'm struggling with right now, I cannot mentally work my way through this. I cannot overcome this by some mental gymnastic or whatever thing, my own strength. I have to surrender and look to Jesus. And when I look to Yeshua, the beauty of who He is and what He has done for me, that is what changes me to turn from sin and empowers me to turn from sin. And so if you are struggling with something, turn to Him and look to Him. When you're literally struggling, when you're in the moment of struggling with something, stop what you're doing and get in prayer, get in worship, look to Him, draw near to Him. He will draw near to you and He will deliver you from your temptations. Now, with this means that you are not your own. He pay, if you give your life to Him, if you say, Jesus, I want to follow you, you're paid with a price. He paid for you with His life. That means that you're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. It means that you decide, God, I'm going to live for you completely. And then with that sonship, and this is the amazing part, it's not just that He saves you to live forever, have eternal life in His presence. It's that He makes you a son. And, and to be a son comes... Let me say it this way. Let's just imagine this for a moment. Just come with me here for a moment. Let's just imagine, um, you know, many, many hundreds of years ago when kings were commonplace in this world. Imagine a king or a queen, a prince or a princess walking through a city. Right, and they're walking and they're walking and there's all of the crowds of people, right? And they're all gathering in the streets to see the king and see the queen walk through the city. Now imagine for a moment that that king or queen, they have no idea who they are. Like they, they, they're, they're all dressed up. They are in their horse carriage. Everyone's there, but they don't know that they're a king. They don't know they're a queen. What would happen? Would there not be some who come and try and take advantage of that situation? Who try and come and steal the crown? of the queen, steal the crown of the king, right? But the moment that queen or king understands who they are, none of that can happen anymore because they understand that they have been given authority through that royal priesthood, that royal lineage that they're a part of. And suddenly no one even tries to touch that crown because they know that they will be thrown in prison the moment they try. And so it is with you. You are part of a royal priesthood. Jesus being the high priest. And He has called you as sons and daughters. And He has come to give you crowns. He's come to give you authority with that. He literally said it to His disciples. But not only to them. He said it to many that He later sent out in the book of Luke. He said, I give you authority over unclean spirits, over sickness, over the devil himself. 
And so with that, if you could understand this authority, if you could understand that you're a son, that you're a daughter of the one true God, then that means that you can carry yourself like a king and like the queen that you are in the spiritual realm, whereas you can walk out your calling, whereas you can put the devil in his place and be a warrior for the kingdom of God. That's what it means to be a son and a believer. It doesn't just mean go to church every Saturday or Sunday or Monday or any day you want. It doesn't mean you just keep the Sabbath. It doesn't mean you just go to Bible study. All those things are wonderful and precious. But it means that when you are in, at school and in your workplace and all the things you're going to do in life, that you manifest the kingdom of God that has come and made home inside of you. That's what it means to truly be a believer. But that can only come about by that intimacy that you have with the one who made you. And so let's answer some of those questions we began with. What is truth truly and is it important? See, can you have a truth and can I have a truth? You, yours, me, mine. Well, here's the thing, thing with truth is if there are two opposite ideas, only one of them can be true. That's the definition of truth. So we can't be like, well, I, I do what I feel is true. You do what you feel is true. Well, one of us is wrong. Truth is not about what I feel is true. Truth is about what the one who is the God of truth, what he has proclaimed to be true. Another question is, well, you know, what if it doesn't hurt anyone? What if, what if this is my truth? But it doesn't, it's not hurting anyone else, so, so why not, right? Or like, why can't I live in that lifestyle? If I'm a boy and I want to be a girl, if I'm a, boy, a girl and I want to be a boy or whatever else, like, and it doesn't hurt anyone else, like, what, what's up with that? What's wrong with that? So here's the thing. There's three different sins or three things really that, go, that Jesus said we should do. You shall love, and these are the greatest. You shall love the Lord your God of all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's three people in there, three groups. So whenever we live in a lie and falsehood, we're either going to not love God, our neighbor, or ourselves. Sexual sin is the sin against the, your own body. And you may say, well, I, I'm not hurting anyone around me. Well, are you hurting God? And is that not an even bigger deal than hurting someone who's a brother or a sister around you? So let's just get real with like who, who we live for. If you live for yourself and you only care about yourself and you are your God, yes, no one else will matter but yourself. And that's really what we're saying. The reality is that everyone does matter. And a life of sacrifice is living as a way of, in a way of, I lower myself, I serve others. That is how Jesus modeled it out. And that's the example that we follow. See, ultimately, your gender... If you're a girl or a boy, and, and, and by the way, this is how we figure that out. You were born a boy or a girl. He made you male or female. And that gender, that sex, is directly directed to, connected to your calling. You cannot fulfill, if you're a girl, you cannot fulfill your kingdom calling as a boy. If you're a boy, you cannot fulfill your kingdom calling as a girl. Because... God made us male and female, and there's amazing giftings and callings and roles that He has given women, and there are amazing giftings and callings He's made men. And they're all both so needed and so precious in the body and in this world. But we have to live as how we were made. We see in, in Genesis 1.31, God saw everything He made after He made man. And behold, it was very good. When He made you, mankind, looked at you. He doesn't say very good about just about anything else in creation. But He, he says good. But then when He gets to you, He says very good. And so here's the thing with truth. Sometimes truth is difficult. 
Sometimes I don't like truth. Sometimes you may not feel like you like truth. Sometimes the truth is that Jesus right now is calling me to get on this water and there are big waves and it's scary. And why is he even calling me to do that in the first place? It makes no sense. What's the role of all of this? Jesus, what's up with this? But he says, come on the water. But this doesn't even feel like it should be like something I can't physically do. But come on the water. Trust me, even if you don't feel like it, even if it doesn't feel like it makes sense to you, if you, when the moment you start walking, you realize that I have made the waves to carry you and nothing will be impossible for you. No matter what the world says about you, what they think and what they say you should be or look like, be what I have called you to be and you will live absolutely fulfilled and enjoy. It doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. I promise you, it's going to be really hard sometimes. We all have different struggles. Some of us, and I'm going to go there, some of us are going to look at a boy or a girl with lust and struggle and maybe even get an addiction and stuff like that, sexual immoralities, and we have to fight against that. While others, some of us, we may struggle, we may be a guy and struggle with an attraction to other guys. Like, like we all, some of us will have the inclination to just take things that aren't ours. Like we're all going to have stuff. We're all going to have different, very different things that we're going to have to fight. But just because our struggle is different doesn't mean it's okay. It means that whatever it is, as long as it's not in line with God's Word, we surrender it up to Him because we want to look more like Him. So here's the thing, love it can, be, it can be a feeling, absolutely, right? Absolutely, like she said. But here's also what the Bible teaches about love. That love is sacrifice. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. There is no greater love than how Jesus laid down His life for you. Even His enemies, even those who put Him on the cross, He dies for. That is what love is. And so, yes, sometimes love can be, uh, I feel this, this just this attraction of love for a person to care for them, to do something for them, to serve them. But we should be careful as to assume, as the world assumes, that love is simply how you feel. It's just love, man. It's just love. Right? And, and so what this does is it makes us think, well, love is whatever I feel, and then it doesn't become about sacrifice. It, see, man, when you have sex with someone, that's not just what love is. Because you can do that and not be willing to die for that person. Do you know what that means? It means you have zilch love. True love Love, if you want to have love, if you want to talk about what love is, love is all or nothing. Love is not, I can kind of feel love. Love is not kind of like, I, love is, I am, and love is not like what I feel. Love is even if I don't feel like it, even if I don't feel in the mood, even though I, don't, even though I feel offended, even though I feel like you're my enemy, even though I feel like whatever I feel, man, you're going to feel a lot of stuff like this. But love, Yeshua, Jesus is like this. He never changes. And so that means that if you truly love someone, no matter what you feel like about them today, and if you get married, you'll notice that some days, like, you don't just, like, always feel it. Sometimes it's like, man, they shouldn't say, have said that to me. You're going to be like, oh, I don't love you anymore because I don't feel like it. Well, that's what the world would really say to you. True love is, I really don't feel like loving you right now, but I choose to love you. Love is a choice. People are also asking, who am I? What am I? Can I be anything I want? What if I feel different from what I am? You are what God has made you to be as we explain. Now, what if you feel different from what you feel like God made you to be? Here's the thing with that. Feelings come by two things. Number one, personal preference. You can be a, a, a boy and you can be like, well, I like the color pink and I like to play with Barbies. That doesn't make you a girl. See, the world's going to come and tell you, and I'm going to warn you now, they're going to come and tell you, you like girly things as a guy. You like to play, have girl, like friends who are girls and, and you, you feel like you connect with girls more. Like maybe you are a girl. 
what? Like, no. Hey, man, there was a time in my life where I had like a lot of friends who were girls. I, we go through seasons and we have preferences. Man, you like pink shirts? Wear a pink shirt. It doesn't make you a girl. You're, you're a, you're a, if you're a girl and you feel like, well, I'm a tomboy. I, I, I feel like I want to play rough in the mud. I play with the guys. I have a lot, a lot of guy friends. I like to climb trees and be rough. Great. That's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you a guy, though. Right? We all have different attributes, personalities, but that does not change our gender. God has made us male and female, and we will very, look very different from one another. It's not like you need to be a Barbie molded thing. There are many do- types of women in this world and men in this world, and they're all precious. Dude, like, look how skinny I am. Imagine like someone comes to me and say, well, you, you like, you're skinny and stuff. Like, I was in school, there was a whole lot of rugby players around me. Big guys, like, oh, rough and tough guys. Awesome, man. I'm not that type of guy. But that doesn't mean I'm a girl. Being truly masculine is being a man of God. Being truly masculine is fighting for your family. Is being a leader of a household. Is being spiritually strong. Standing up, me and my house, we will serve the Lord as we just sang. These are things that we attach sometimes to the wrong kind of things because the world wants to twist your identity into something you're really not. So here's the thing. You feel like you're, like, look around the room, really. And, and I want you to, at this camp, find someone who's out, who feels weird, the people pe- the, that the world calls the losers. Let me tell you something about what Jesus says about the losers. Jesus says they will inherit the earth. He says the meek will inherit the earth. The proud, those who are all cool and stuff. Man, I don't want to be cool with men. I want to be cool with God. Because ultimately, Jesus, when He came, He looked to the lowest of the lowest people, those who everyone else looked down on, and He went after them. He dined with them. He spent time with them. And the rich and famous, He was like... I did not come for the healthy, I came for the sick. And he said, I come and he, and he exalts the, the lowly, whether it's the little, little children who in that t- time were, were considered uh, lowly, he exalts them high. See, that's what we're called to do. You are called to be like Jesus to your friends, and especially those who feel out, those who feel weird, those who are a little different. Like, be a love to them, be Jesus to them, be their friend. If you're, especially if you're a kid or if you're an, uh, if you're an adult like that's, you know, you're, you're, everyone likes you, you know, we, we kind of have those people in this world, praise God that He's given that to you, then use what He has given you to love those who feel unloved. If you feel loved, love those who don't. That's what Jesus calls us to be. This, the second thing that I want to just talk about there is, is the other thing that shapes our feelings is what we get taught. See, if you're addicted to pornography and you watch porn and that's where you get your teaching, which will be your teacher if you watch it, you will be taught by it. You can say, I won't. But as an example, if you do that, then what's going to happen is that lie, which is twisted, it's not real life. It's all fake. It's all counterfeit. It's n- none of that is real. It brings destruction. But when you perceive those things and you allow those that... I'm going to use nice words. You allow that stuff to be your teacher of what real life is. That's going to influence your sexuality. That's going to influence the way you see yourself. That's going to influence the way you see others. That's going to influence your marriage. Even if you get married in 20 years, doesn't matter. You can say, well, when I get married, I'll stop. I promise you, first off, that's a, that's a good cop-out. Second off, you're going to get there and you're going to find yourself being so influenced by things you watched 20 years ago that you're still going to have to fight it. Stop today. For the sake of your husband, for the sake of your future wife. And so, don't let the world and those things teach you about who you are. Let He be the voice that determines your identity. This is what Jesus says. 
He doesn't say, find yourself. He says, find me. He doesn't say, follow your heart. He says, follow me. The world says, numb the pain. Jesus says, experience me. So he is the ultimate destination and the one to experience. He is the way, the truth and the life. And if you see him, you see yourself. So I'm going to end with this prayer. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would come and just reveal to each and every one of us, Father, the truth of who we are, the truth of who you are. And Holy Spirit, I pray that every child in this room, that you would be with them and you would convict them, that you would, that you would, your presence would be so evident in all of the struggles that we will face. Father, I thank you for your mercy and grace when we stumble, that you always forgive us, that you are quick to forgive us as we come to you. And Father, I pray that each and every one of these, that you will draw them to you whenever they stumble, whenever they struggle. Thank you.